Good evening. Thank you for joining us tonight. Take your copies of the scriptures and open them to the book of Daniel. Once again, chapter 9. And uh, we're going to finish up Daniel's prayer tonight. I was telling Pastor this morning, I think he did such a wonderful job sharing the text that I thought I might just come up and say, ditto what Pastor said and pray, but we're going <laughs> to... We're going to dive into a couple other things, I think, that, though maybe a repeat of what Pastor was sharing this morning, I think are very important for us today, very instructive. I am going to begin, though, by reading all of the first 19 verses of Daniel 9, just to give us the context of our text today, which is uh, verse number 11 through 19. Daniel 9, beginning at verse 1, says, In the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus, of the seed of Medes, which was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by books the number of the years whereof the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet, that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. And I set my face unto the Lord to seek by prayer and supplications with fasting and sackcloth and ashes And I prayed unto the Lord my God and made my confession and said, O Lord, the great and dreadful or the great and awesome God, keeping the covenant and mercy to them that love him and to them that keep his commandments, we have sinned. We have committed iniquity and have done wickedly and have rebelled even by departing from thy precepts and from thy judgments. Neither have we hearkened unto thy servants the prophets which spake in thy name to our kings, our princes, and our fathers, and to all the people of the land. O Lord, righteousness belongeth unto thee, but unto us confusion of faces as it is this day. To the men of Judah and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem that are far off through all the countries whither thou hast driven them because of their trespass that they have trespassed against thee. O Lord, to us belongeth confusion of face, to our kings, to our princes, to our fathers, because we have sinned against thee. To the Lord our God belongs mercies and forgiveness, though we have rebelled against him. Neither have we obeyed the voice of the Lord our God to walk in his laws, which he set before us by his servants, the prophets. Yea, all Israel have transgressed thy law, even by departing, that they might not obey thy voice. Therefore, the curse is poured upon us, and the oath that is written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, because we have sinned against him. And he hath confirmed his words, which he spake against us and against our judges that judged us, by bringing upon us a great evil. For under the whole heaven hath not been done as hath been done upon Jerusalem. As it is written in the law of Moses, all this evil has come upon us, Yet made we not our prayer before the Lord our God, that we might turn from our iniquities and understand thy truth. Therefore hath the Lord watched upon the evil and brought it upon us, for the Lord our God is righteous in all his works which he doeth, for we obeyed not his voice. And now, O Lord our God, that has brought thy people forth out of the land of Egypt with a mighty hand, and has gotten thee renown, as it is this day, We have sinned. We have done wickedly. O Lord, according to all thy righteousness, I beseech thee, let thine anger and thy fury be turned away from thy city Jerusalem, thy holy mountain, because for our sins and for the iniquities of our fathers, Jerusalem and thy people are become a reproach to all that are about us. Now, therefore, O our God, hear the prayer of thy servant and his supplications. And cause thy face to shine upon thy sanctuary that is desolate for the Lord's sake. O my God, incline thine ear and hear. Open thine eyes and behold our desolations. And the city which is called by thy name. For we do not present our supplications before thee for our righteousnesses. But for thy great mercies. O Lord, hear. O Lord, forgive O Lord, hearken and do, defer not for thine own sake, O my God. For thy city and thy people are called by thy name. 
you can just hear the anguish in Daniel's voice as he cries out to the Lord. And as Pastor shared this morning, one of the greatest applications we can draw from this is that of humility before God in the posture of prayer. How we can pour our hearts before the Lord. Our uh, sins individually and collectively as a society are rightly to be judged one day by God. Sometimes he withholds his judgment and waits till the final day. Other times he judges in the moment. Regardless, God, as Daniel says, is righteous in what he has done, is righteous in his condemnation of sins. And to us belongs open shame, to God belongs righteousness. Last time we talked about how we were looking at specifically Daniel's reference to God's righteousness in judging his people. And we, I showed you back all the way book in the book of the Pentateuch how the Lord had promised to his people, Israel, if you obey, you'll be blessed. If you don't, if you disobey me, then curse will be your family, curse will be your land, cursed will be your produce. And I mean, all of these curses are pronounced on them. And here is what Daniel is saying. You are right in what you have done. We deserve the chastisement that you have given to us. There is no way in which we can stand before you and say, but, 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 but what are you doing? There are some of us who are righteous. Daniel says, no. God alone is righteous in what he has done in this situation. We have been brought into captivity and driven away from our city because of our sin. And God is righteous and just in what he has done. And so we talked about the restoration that Daniel longed for his people, that he wanted to see Israel turn back to the Lord. And so on behalf of his people, he cries out to God and says, Lord, I am crying out to you. Hear my prayer. But then he invokes God's covenant name and then reminds him that we, you are our God. The pagans, they have their pagan deities. They have their false deities. But you... The one true God, you're ours. We belong to you. And so hear my prayer on behalf of my people. Turn us back to yourself and look at my heart and see that I long that your glory would be on display. I think that is clearly going to come up in today's text. So that's what we looked at last time. And I won't re-preach what I said last Sunday night. But I do want to bring up something today that has really been on my mind lately, um, in part because of some books I've read, in part because of reading through the Bible currently, and in part because of some classes I took. And I am just shocked, really, at how often I have viewed sin so casually, um, in such a way that I, I marveled at my own casual view of sin as a pastor at times, and I thought, what is wrong? And I believe Scripture gives us the answer to why we tend to do that. And so today, what I'd like to share with you is a continuation of what we talked about last Sunday from verses 11 down through verse 19, but almost more like a Bible study than a sermon. We'll have, I'll have two truths that we can hang our hats on as we walk through and talk through it, but I just want to treat this as if we're walking through, discussing this together about what the Lord has to say about sin, because this is what I've been tasked to preach from this text. And the one thing that I think I really want to stress today is God's glory, as Pastor has very well expressed to us last Sunday and even this morning, that God's glory, but I want to to express to you and to challenge you tonight with a specific aspect of God's glory, and that is his holiness. With that being said, then, I want you to turn with me back to Genesis chapter 3. In Genesis chapter 3, we already saw this last Sunday in Sunday school, and you are very familiar with this text, so I don't need to explain everything, but I do want to read a couple verses from here. In Genesis 3, God's greatest creation, the culmination of his creation, man, is in this scenario where a serpent, whom we know later to be identified as Satan himself, 
is testing the waters, as it were, with humanity. And he says in verse 1, as he sees the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of every tree, uh, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, Ye shall not eat it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said to the woman, Ye shall not surely die. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof, and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. And before I read verse 7, I want us to recognize how poignant verse 7 is. Because in Genesis 1 and 2, what's on display? The creator God creating everything. The self-existent being creating things and bringing them into existence. So there's the creator who has then made his creation. And this God made them all very good. It says in Genesis 1, 31, And God saw, God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. Everything God had made was very good. There is nothing in God's holy presence whereby he could look at his creation and say, wow, that, that actually wasn't a good, let me restart over. There was none of that. Everything he had seen was perfect. And therefore, when he was with his creation, there was this intimate unity and fellowship that he could have with them. There was, there was this open communication. But then Genesis 3 happens. And all of a sudden, there is this character introduced who seeks to question God's word and God's goodness and what he has done. And after Adam and Eve hear what he has to say, and when she, the woman, looks at the tree that it was good for food, it was pleasant to the eyes, a tree to make, desired to make one wise, she decides that this is something she should do. She should eat of it. And Adam, knowing full well that what he was about to do was complete rebellion against God, says, I'm going to follow suit. I'm going to do the same thing. And after he did, verse 7 happens. Then the eyes of them both were opened. Open to what? What did they need to be open to see? They needed to be open to see the tragic nature of what they had done. So much so, in verse 7, it says that they knew they were naked. And what did they do? They sewed fig leaves together to make themselves aprons, to make themselves coverings. What are they trying to do? Well, in our human society, we wear clothes, right? In our, our civilized human society, we wear clothes. Why? Because it's shameful to be in a state whereby people can see your nakedness, and to use the terms of Scripture— but here was Adam and Eve prior to this. They, there was no need for coverings. They were perfect. They had this perfect relationship with God. All of a sudden, it's broken. And what do Adam and Eve all of a sudden recognize? They recognize that they're no longer perfect. And they recognize that their rebellious act towards God resulted in a fear. Because before, it seems as though, according to the wording of verse 8, that the Lord would have this intimate fellowship with them, and he would walk with them. And most likely, in their minds, this was a wonderful opportunity to spend time with their creator, with God. Normally, what they would welcome with open arms and with excitement, all of a sudden, has become something of terror for them, because it says... In verse 8, and they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife, what, ran to God and said, Lord, we sinned. No. They went and hid themselves. They hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. And ever since then, humanity has constantly sought to hide himself from God. It's a daily reminder now to me every time I put clothes on 
that I wish in my sin to hide myself from God. But the question in my mind should be, why? Why do I want to hide myself from God? And the reality of it is because God is utterly separate from me now. He's always been utterly separate, but in a unique way, very separate from me now. Because before, humanity had this perfect relationship with God such that they were able to have this communion together. But now they can't. Why? Because man had the audacity to rebel against what God had said. And so ever since Genesis 3, you have a record from Genesis 4 onward of mankind constantly hiding himself from the presence of God. And why? Because God is separate. He is uniquely separate. And the word that I want to use, that Scripture uses over and over and over again, is that he's holy. He's holy. And there are so many instances in Scripture, example after example, where people are exposed to God's holiness. And what do they do? Do they casually say, oh, yeah, it's, it's as maybe flippantly some might say in our culture, it's just the man upstairs. It's, oh, it's just the God of the Christians, but there's other gods too, like the God of Muslims and the God of Buddha and, and the God of any other religion that there is. But people who were exposed to the holiness of this one and only true God quaked in his presence. To give you an example of this, Exodus, chapter 3, Moses, who's writing this Pentateuch, many have referred to it as the first five books of the Bible, hence Pentateuch, Penta 5. But really, it's one long book, essentially, that Moses has an encounter with this God. And it says in verse 1 of Exodus 3, Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priests of Midian, and he led the flock to the backside of the desert and came to the mountain of God, even to Horeb. Then notice this, verse 2, And the angel of the Lord... Notice that the word Lord there is all caps. That's God's covenant name. The angel of Jehovah, the angel of Yahweh, appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush burned with fire, and the bush was not consumed. And Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight. Why the bush is not burned? And when Yahweh, Jehovah, saw that he turned aside to see, God called unto him out of the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here am I. And here's what the Lord tells him. Draw not nigh hither. That's a complete contrast to what Adam and Eve before had experienced. Before their fall, they could draw near to God. Because they were perfect. God had created them perfectly to have this perfect friendship and this perfect relationship with him. So there was nothing that they had done. They were in complete submission to him. But once they sinned, they were driven away. In fact, we didn't read it. But then at the end of Genesis 3, what ends up happening to Adam and Eve? They're driven from the garden. And there's an angel there with a flaming sword that goes in any direction making sure that they cannot come back in his presence. And what does the Lord tell Moses? Well, he had said in verse 5, Draw not hither, put off thy shoes from off thy feet, for the place whereon thou standest is holy ground. Holy ground. Separate ground from you. You are a sinful creature who has rebelled against me. And as a holy God, I cannot allow that in my presence. And so out of submission to the Lord, Moses does that very thing. And then it says in verse 6, Moreover, he said, I am the God of thy father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And then what does it say in that last sentence there, verse 6? And Moses looked at God and just stared at him. Moses ran to God to get into his arms because he's just this grandfatherly figure that wants to love us all and wants us all to get along. 
What does Moses do? Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. The complete, separate holiness of God terrified him. And he hid himself, just as Adam and Eve had hid themselves, and just like every human has done since the fall, hidden themselves from God. Because when you're exposed to his holiness, you recognize how separate God is from you. Well, I read in my devotions actually this morning from Exodus 20, and it was, it was not something I'd originally planned to add into my notes for today, but it fits so well. Then Exodus 20, we know obviously the Lord is giving the Ten Commandments to Moses. And after he has given these Ten Commandments to them, it says in verse 18, And all the people saw the thunderings and the lightnings and the noise of the trumpet and the mountain smoking. And when the people saw it, they removed and stood afar off. Did they run away just because they hadn't seen thunder and lightning before? Or was there something unique about this? Verse 19, And they said to Moses, Speak thou with us. You talk to us and we'll hear. But this, le- this last phrase here, verse 19, But let not God speak with us. Why? Lest we die. God is holy. And to be in the presence of holy God is to expose your sin before him. And so what does Moses tell them in verse 20? Moses said to the people, fear not, for God is come to prove you or to test you. That, notice this, his fear may be before your faces that ye sin not. That his fear, is this just some kind of like, oh, well, I have a, I have a very deep respect for the Lord. I totally understand when people talk in terms of that, having a healthy respect, having a reverential, I completely understand that. But honestly, I think people need to get back to the reality that God is so holy and God is just in his condemnation of anything that is not holy, that is unholy, that when people are in his presence, they fear. They're afraid. Why do you think we have a culture that is filled with people who don't care about what the Bible says? who don't care about biblical principles. It's because they don't fear God anymore. They don't understand how utterly separate they are from Him, how holy He is, and how unholy they are. Why is it that so many Christians treat their sin cavalierly? Because they do not understand how holy God is. I was thinking about this and so convicted by this about how when I sin, whatever it may be, that in that moment, I've decided that what is more important to me is my right, my sin, my expression of wickedness, rather than my knowledge and focus on God and His holiness. When the people were exposed to the holiness of God, the majesty of God, the glory of God, they feared, and I believe rightly so. Because when people have a right view of God, they're terrified. Another one that Pastor referenced this morning in his sermon, I think illustrates once again that this is more than simply a reverential awe. That this is a terror. Because when you get to Isaiah 6, Isaiah has this this vision where he says, I saw also the Lord sitting upon the throne. Is this just some guy who's sitting there and he's like, oh, wow, that's cool. No. He sees a king who's sitting on his throne. High, lifted up, elevated above everything else. There's nobody above him. Which just goes to show you how atrocious Satan's rebellion was because he had the audacity to say, I will make my throne like God's. I will elevate myself like God, above God. But here Isaiah sees the Lord 
in his glory, sitting on a throne, a king reigning over his kingdom. And his train filled the temple. Verse 2, above it stood the seraphims. Each one had six wings. With twain he covered his face. And with twain means two. With two he covered his feet. And with two he did fly. And they cried to one another. And what are they saying? Love, love, love. Goodness, goodness, goodness. They're saying holy, holy, holy. They're expressing their adoration and worship of a thrice holy God. And if you were in the shoes of Isaiah, as you read or excuse me, read, as you see what he has written down in verse 4, the posts of the door moved, they shook, they trembled at the voice of him that cried out, and the house was filled with smoke. What does Isaiah do? He's like, hey, let me get my uh, camera here. Do you mind if I take a selfie quick? No. It says in verse 5, he cries out, woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of holy lips? I am a man of pure lips? I am a man of clean lips? No. I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for mine eyes have seen the King. The King. The Lord, Yahweh, Jehovah of hosts. This is Isaiah who sees God's holiness on display and cries out, I believe, in terror because he recognizes his sin before God. He sees how holy and separate God is and says, I'm not like that. I don't deserve to be in the presence of this king who is completely separate from what is wicked and evil and sinful. I deserve to be obliterated, to be judged because of my sin. That's why he says, I'm a man of unclean lips. He acknowledges his personal sin, and he says, I dwell in a people of unclean lips. I'm in a nation, I'm in a world filled with people who are completely unholy, the opposite of what God is. And so when he is exposed to God's glory, he cries out and says, what can I do? I'm undone. I'm about to get incinerated. Would to the Lord that more people understood God's holiness, God's complete separateness from us, particularly his own people, whom he loves. All of this, I hope, helps set up somewhat the contrast between Israel, Daniel's people, and the God to whom he prays. Because the God to whom he prays is completely separate and righteous and holy from those people. I, was, I received an email this week that was such a blessing to me. And a passage of scripture was directed to my attention that I'd like to share with you. It's in Ezekiel 36. As we come back now to Israel... You cannot, and I appreciate this about pastor's ministry here, you cannot understand sin until you understand God's glory, and I would say in particular, God's holiness. That as we look at Daniel's prayer and his cry out for the Lord to show mercy, that is what we ought to be crying out for. In Ezekiel 36, you have this wonderful and indicting prayer prophecy. And I'm going to begin, for sake of time, I'm going to begin a little further down than I was. I'm going to begin in verse 16. Moreover, the word of the Lord, or the word of Yahweh, came unto me, saying, Ezekiel 36 now, verse 17, Son of man, when the house of Israel dwelt in their own land, they defiled it by their own way and by their doings, their way was before me as the uncleanness of a removed woman. 
Wherefore I poured my fury upon them, for the blood that they had shed upon the land, and for their idols wherewith they had polluted it, and I scattered them among the heathen, and they were dispersed through the countries according to their way and according to their doings. I judged them. Could Israel turn back to the Lord and say, whoa, whoa, wait, 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 what are you doing? We don't deserve this. The Lord says, no, you don't. You, you, don't think, you don't think you can talk back to me like that. I'm going to reward you according to what you have done. You have rebelled against me. Your wickedness, your uncleanness has done this. And so he says, I poured my fury on them, verse 18. And then verse 19, I scattered them among the heathen, and they were dispersed amongst the countries. Is that what had happened to Israel? You better believe it. You better believe it. That's why Daniel is in the place he is in. Because they were dispersed. In verse 20, And when they entered into the heathen whither they went, they profaned my holy name. When they said to them, These are the people of the Lord, of Yahweh, and are gone forth out of his land. But notice this in verse 21. But I had pity for mine holy name. My holy name. I had concern for my name, which the house of Israel had profaned among the heathen, whither they went. Therefore, verse 22, say unto the house of Israel, thus says the Lord God, I do not this for your sakes, O house of Israel, but for mine holy name's sake, which ye have profaned among the heathen, whither ye went. And I will sanctify my great name, which was profaned among the heathen, which ye have profaned in the midst of them. And the heathen shall know that I am the Lord, Yahweh, saith the Lord God, when I shall be sanctified in you before their eyes. For I will take you from among the heathen and will gather you out of all countries and will bring you into your own land. Then will I sprinkle clean water upon you, and ye shall be clean from all your filthiness, and from all your idols will I cleanse you. God's cleaning them. Can they stand before God and say, I have some kind of merit that I can bring before you. I know we did wickedly, but I did this, 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 and this before you. And so therefore, now you should let us go back and show us your kind face again? God says, I'm going to cleanse you. I'm going to cleanse you. Verse 26, a new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you, and I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you an heart of flesh, and I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, and ye shall keep my judgments and do them, and ye shall dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers, and ye shall be my people, and I will be your God. I will also save you from all your uncleanness, and will call for the corn, and will increase it, and lay no famine upon you, and I will multiply the fruit of the tree and the increase of the field, that ye shall receive no more reproach of famine among the heathen. Then shall ye re- Remember your own evil ways and your doings that were not good and shall loathe yourselves in your own sight for your iniquities and for your abominations. And notice he says this again, verse 32. Not for your sakes do I this, saith the Lord God. Be it known unto you. Be ashamed and confounded for your own ways, O house of Israel. Thus says the Lord God, in the day that I shall have cleansed you from all your iniquities, I will also cause you to dwell in the cities and the waste shall be built, and then the desolate land shall be tilled, whereas it lay desolate in the sight of all that passed by. And they shall say, this land that was desolate, it become like the Garden of Eden. And the waste and desolate and ruined cities are become fenced and are inhabited. Then the heathen that are left round about you shall know that I, the Lord, Jehovah, Yahweh, build the ruined places and plant that That was desolate. I, the Lord, have spoken it, and I will do it. Thus saith the Lord God, I will yet for this be inquired of by the house of Israel to do it for them. I will increase them with men like a flock, as the holy flock, as the flock of Jerusalem in her solemn feast. So shall the waste cities be filled with the flocks of men, and they shall know that I am the Lord. Jehovah, Yahweh. The Lord is doing this for the sake of his holy name, 
for his glory on display amongst the pagan nations and in some ways is undoing the undoing of the creation. <laughs> because he says in verse 35, this land that is deathless will come like the Garden of Eden. Do you think that was an accident that the Lord says that? I don't think so. I think that was incredibly intentional. There was this Garden of Eden, this perfect relationship with God. Man in his sin has fallen. And then there is, as Pastor has showed us throughout Scripture, this almost uncreation that has happened. But then one day, there will be this new creation again where all things will be restored. So Daniel cries out to the Lord then. You say, why are, why are you sharing all these verses? Here's why. Because when you read Daniel's prayer then from verses 11 all the way down through verse 19, does he ever say anything about just because you love your people and because your people, I mean, they've been in this long enough, don't you think? 70 years, don't you think that's long enough? What does he appeal to, to the Lord, to restore them again? Notice what he says. O Lord, verse 16, according to all thy righteousness, I beseech thee. Know therefore, O our God, verse 17, the prayer of thy servant and his supplications and cause thy face to shine upon thy sanctuary that is desolate. For whose sake? The Lord's sake. Verse 18, O my God, incline thine ear and hear, open thine eyes and behold our desolation in the city which is called by thy name. For we do not present our supplications before thee for our righteousness, but for what? Thy great mercies. Verse 19, O Lord, hear. O Lord, forgive O Lord, hearken and do, defer not for whose sake? Your own. For your city and for your people are called by whose name? Yours. So what is the basis of Daniel's prayer that his people would turn to the Lord as a nation? Not because of any good they had done, because clearly there was nothing good they had done. In fact, they, like all of humanity, experience the judgment of God should they persist in their rebellion. But Daniel recognizes, we have no righteousness. What are we going to do? Here's what you're going to do. You're going to appeal to the God who is holy to forgive you based on his righteousness because we've got none. And this same prayer is what every single person is called to make today. To appeal to a holy God who is utterly separate from us, who is so holy that were you to actually stand in God's presence as Isaiah had a chance to today in this moment, do you realize what you would actually be doing? You would be falling flat on your face. You would be terrified because he is so holy. But the joyous reality of the gospel is that Jesus God's righteous Messiah who was in and of himself righteous because he was the God-man. He was man, truly man, but he was also truly God who lived a life of sinless perfection, perfectly accomplishing what God the Father's will was for him, even to the point of death on a cross, which was determined before the foundation of the world by the predetermined counsel of God. It wasn't a plan B. It wasn't a, oh no, the guy I sent down there, they killed him. What am I going to do now? This was God's plan from the beginning to rescue helpless sinners because he's holy and he cannot look on sin, but he's also merciful and he forgives. And he calls out to everyone to repent, to turn to a holy God who can offer his righteousness to them so that then they could be called, as the New Testament says, sons of God. They could have this renewed relationship like they had in the Garden of Eden. And then we can, like scriptures say, approach God's throne boldly because we don't have to fear him. We're not approaching him on our own merit anymore. We can't. There is no merit we've ha we have. We've got none. But we can approach the Lord on the merit that Jesus' righteousness has been put on us. 
so that then we can stand before him one day. And I'm still convinced that though the scriptures describe us as God's children, Christians, those who have exercised faith in Jesus Christ's atoning work on the cross, that even though we still are God's children and we can call him Abba, Father, I understand all of that, I still think there's more than just a reverential awe we will feel and experience when we stand in God's presence one day, when we see the incomprehensible God in his glory and holiness, that we will still wonder that this holy God should set his love and affection on me when I deserve his wrath and judgment? But a fear, a healthy fear, trembling at his holiness, his glory that's on display, which we'll never, never understand completely. It's this God that Daniel appeals to, and all of that was just my introduction. So uh, I'll just close with this, that Daniel wanted to see his people experience spiritual restoration, and it begins with the recognition and acknowledgement of sin's serious consequences. That, that was point one. And when we understand that, then we need to understand and acknowledge sin's somber cure. That's point two. Sin's somber cure is our humility in posturing ourselves before the Lord in such a way that acknowledges that we submit to him as holy God and appeal to him on the basis not of ourselves because we've got nothing to offer to him, but on the basis of Christ's righteousness alone. And may that be the prayer of our hearts as we look at our nation, as we look at the nations of the world. No reform, no amazing Laws in our land can rectify the sinful condition of humanity. It is only by, as the reformers called, an alien righteousness, a righteousness that's foreign to us, can we experience that spiritual restoration. And so may our prayer in our nation not only be that it would turn to the Lord, but that it would do so by the gospel power that we preach. May that, Lord, be our prayer. May we have a healthy respect for your holiness. Help us to catch a glimpse better each day this week of your holiness as we go to work, as we go to school, as we spend time with our families. Lord, the amazing grace that John Newton wrote about is truly still incomprehensible to us that a holy God should set his love and affection on a rebellious people. Please turn the stony hearts of unsaved people into the soft hearts that are tender to the working of your spirit and your word. Lord, I don't know if there's someone here tonight who does not know you as Savior, who does not know that on his or her own they have nothing of good to offer you. So if that person is here within earshot of my voice, Lord, I pray that your spirit would take your words that were read from the scriptures and change their hearts, turn them to yourself, because they cannot in and of themselves. And for the people in this room, Lord, and who are listening now, who do love you, who have experienced this new birth, new restoration, may they have a renewed desire for knowing and loving your holiness such that it would produce in us a people who are holy because as you say, we are to be holy even as you are. And I pray this in Christ's name.